So let's give Julian Bonnie a big hand. Yeah. It takes a lot to come up here in front of all y'all and do something like that, especially with children volunteers where you don't know what's going to happen. So they're brave like Gideon was, man. So kids, and actually before I start, I want to say I let the kids have those horns because adults, if you fall asleep, we're going to encircle you, blow those horns, we'll wake you right up. So it was kind of selfish of me to do that, but... So kids, we are so glad you're with us this morning. So there's two things I want you to do. So listen up, pay attention. First, I want you to have your Bibles open. Have your Bibles open in front of you. If you can't read, have your parent or grandparent read along with you, but I want you to have your Bibles open. The second thing, look at the back of the worship folder. There's fill in the blanks. So kids, if you fill in those fill in the blanks throughout the sermon, and then go find Mr. Lee. He's back at the entrance. Find him after service. Mr. Lee has a special prize for you. College students, if you fill in the blanks and go show Mr. Lee after service, he's just going to throw something at you. But kids, we have something special for you. So pay attention. Fill those out. So we had just heard about how Gideon had gone from a guy scared hiding in a wine press, doubting God to the deliverer of Israel. He was the judge. He was called by God to free the Israelites. But a sad thing happens. It doesn't stay that way. Things don't continue to go well. Um, My youngest, Ari, she's three years old, and she loves riding her scooter. And I don't know if it's because she's so tiny or what, but when she's on that thing, she is just so cute and she's like thinks she's like the coolest kid in the neighborhood and she's whipping around corners going fast well a couple months ago we're going around a block and I'm walking behind her and things are going just fine and all of a sudden I don't know if she saw a bird or what but she starts looking up and guess what happens veers to the left into the rocks skins her knee tears I pick her up I make sure she's okay and I tell her honey you have to focus. If you don't, you're going to crash. So a couple weeks later, same thing. But I'm, she's my fourth child, so I'm kind of smart. I learn things. So I'm walking beside her. I figure, okay, I'm going to run beside her. That way, if she crashes, I'll catch her. So we're going. Things are going great. But she thought it was hilarious that I was running next to her. So of course, the whole time she's looking up at me as we're going, crashes. I don't catch her. She falls, skins her knees, skins her elbow. She even skinned her chin. Tears. Yeah, it was sad. But I pick her up and I'm like, sweetie, you have to focus. If you don't, you will crash. And that's what we see here with Gideon. He loses focus and he crashes and it has tragic consequences. So today, I want you to take away with you, the take home point is that you must stay focused on God because if you don't, you'll crash. We're going to be looking at Judges 7, 23, all the way through chapter 8, verse 32. So if you're using one of the Pew Bibles, it's page 170 and 171. And if you don't have a Bible at home, take that with you. That's our gift to you. Even though the verses are going to be up on the screen, I want everyone, kids and adults, to have the Bible open because I'm going to be paraphrasing a lot and then referencing back to specific verses. So having a Bible open is going to help you follow along. So in Judges 7, 23, Gideon and Israel, Israelites are victorious. The Midianite army flees, and now Gideon's chasing after him. So that's where we start. So Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh were called out, and they pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim were called out. And they seized the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Barah. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the Rock of Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. 
They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Orb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. But he answered them, What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Ebiezer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, the resentment against him subsided. So let's stop right there. So remember, it was God who had caused the 135,000 Midianite soldiers to flee. He caused them to panic. God caused them to attack themselves, and then God caused them to run. Gideon and the Israelites had just witnessed the miraculous working and deliverance of God. I mean, I could just imagine them sitting back and just being like, we just watched God work in an incredible way. Gideon's victorious. Israel is free from oppression. And it was all because God had answered their prayers. Gideon at this moment is on top of the world. And that actually brings us to our first point. It's easy to take your focus off of God, especially when life is going well. So if you're filling in the blanks, kids, that's your first one. It's easy to take your focus off of God, especially when life is going well. Last season, the Alabama football team went undefeated, and they didn't just win. They crushed the opponents. I mean, they cruise through the regular season undefeated. And the whole time, Nick Saban, who's their, who's their coach, and he's probably the best football coach in college football history, or at least one of the best. Also one of the scariest men you'll ever meet. But he's telling his team the whole season, telling his team, telling the media, we can't lose focus. We can't let this success derail us. So they win a playoff game, so they're going to the national championship. So that night, they go to national championship, and I bet you could guess what happened. <sighs> they lost to Clemson. Oh, and they didn't just lose. They got dominated. And afterwards, Nick Saban's trying to make sense of what happened. And he basically said, because of the success we had during the regular season, we didn't have the focus we needed to succeed in the end. And for Gideon, we're going to see that though God granted him this incredible success, he doesn't have the focus, <coughs> excuse me, to finish strong. And we even start to get a glimpse of this in chapter 8, verse 2. So look at chapter 8, verse 2. When the people of Ephraim are giving Gideon a hard time for not calling them to the battle earlier, they say, he says, what have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest, harvest of Ebiezer? So Ebiezer is Gideon's family name. So basically what Gideon is saying here is my victory was nothing. The battle I was just in, yeah, that's small beans compared to what you guys accomplished. But wait a minute. In Gideon's battle, who caused the Midianite army to panic? Who caused them to flee? Whose victory was that? It was God's. In Gideon's battle, whose glory and power was put on display? It was God's. But here, Gideon, trying to appease the Ephraimites, he's saying, nah, what happened there isn't nearly as awesome as what you guys did. It's just a little small thing. I don't doubt Gideon was just trying to avoid another fight. But notice that the focus is taken off of God and glory is given to men. How could this happen? I mean, Gideon is literally like 30 minutes removed from watching God crush an army that they had no right winning against. How could Gideon lose focus so quickly? It's simple. It's our sinful nature. Because of Adam and Eve's sin, who were representatives for all of humanity, all of us have what's called a sinful nature. That means that everyone born after Adam and Eve have this thing that's part of them 
that causes them to naturally want to rebel against God, to break his rules, to run from him, to turn their back from him and worship and live for anything but him. And this sinful nature touches every part of who we are and it affects everything that we do. That's why the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And Jesus says in Mark 7, 21 through 22, For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. We have to understand that who we are apart from Christ, it's not who you were created to be. You were created by God to be in relationship with God, to be resting in him and living for his glory. So apart from Jesus and apart from the continuing work of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be less than your true self. You are going to be less than what you're meant to be. So apart from following your own heart and it leading to contentment, happiness, and fulfillment, if you just follow your own heart, it's going to lead to struggle and heartache and tragedy. The sinful nature within each of us, it will lead us astray if we don't focus on Christ. I don't care how great your life looks from the outside. It doesn't matter how long you have walked with Christ. If you lose focus, you will wander, and it will have consequences. How many of us right now could be falling into this trap? I have a couple questions I want you to kind of ask yourselves and work through. So the first one, and I think we all need to start here. Do I know and have I experienced the grace and forgiveness of God? It's one thing to know about God's grace and forgiveness. It's another thing to have experienced, to place your face in it, faith in it, and be reconciled to him. So then the second question is, have I taken God's grace for granted? And the third, as it is every area of my life lived for God's glory? If you can't answer an emphatic yes to each of those questions, then maybe your focus has never been on Christ, or maybe you've lost focus, but your focus has been taken off of God and placed somewhere else. And I know that sounds extreme. I know for some of us that sounds a little harsh, but because of our sinful nature, that's the reality of the situation we're in. So I'm going to paraphrase a big part of chapter 8 now. So verses 4 through 17, we see Gideon pursuing the Midianite army. He travels through these towns of Succoth and Peniel, and he asks both of them for help. They refuse to help him, so he swears vengeance on them. He says, I'll be back, and it's not going to be good for you. So it's important to note that the town of Succoth is where Jacob went to right after he was reconciled to Esau. So if you don't know the story, Jacob steals Esau's birthright, which is basically like his inheritance, and then he steals his blessing. Esau wants to kill him, so, Esau, or so Jacob runs. After a while, Jacob returns, and instead of wrath from Esau, Jacob receives forgiveness. They're reconciled, and then Jacob goes to the town of Succoth. The next one, Peniel, that's where Jacob wrestled with God. And instead of being crushed, he, God blesses him. And Jacob leaves that place a changed man. So Gideon travels through these towns. They don't help. He swears vengeance. He catches the Midianite kings, and then Gideon returns. And he exacts that vengeance. And, but he even ups it a little bit. He told Pen the people of Peniel he'd tear down their tower he tears down her tower and then kills every man in that city. In these towns where the great patriarch, patriarch of Israel, Jacob, was shown so much grace and so much forgiveness, Gideon, 
whom himself was shown so much grace and so much forgiveness and so much blessings from God. Gideon, though, exacts revenge on the very people God had called him to save. Then in verses 18 through 21, we see Gideon talking to the Midianite kings, and he asked them about this event that we don't have record of. But come to find out, these kings killed all of Gideon's brothers. So Gideon's not chasing after them for God's glory. He's not chasing after them necessarily to save Israel. Gideon has a personal vendetta here. Because he even says, if you hadn't killed my brothers, I wouldn't be killing you. But guess what? This is what you're going to get. We just notice that Gideon's focus is placed more and more off of God, more and more on himself. It's all about Gideon's rights. It's all about what Gideon thinks best. It's all about Gideon's circumstances. So then, in verse 22 through 32, and we're going to read this part, it reads, The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord, he will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of plunder. It was custom that the Ishmaelites wear gold earrings. They answered, we will be glad to give them to you. So they spread out the garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, or the chains that were on their camels' necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for 40 years. Jerobel, son of Joash, which is just another name for Gideon, went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Abizrites. So from this last part, I just want to know a few things. First, that while Gideon doesn't accept the Israelites' offer to rule over them, he takes the spoils that a victorious king would have. He takes the jewels, robes, and items from the Midianite kings. And we, hear from the, we found out from the Midianite kings that uh, Gideon and his family looked like royalty, and then Gideon goes and lives a life that a king during that time would have lived. And in case you're not sold quite yet that Gideon had taken his focus off of God, uh, uh, opposed to what he said, he names one of his sons Abimelech, which means son of a king. So he pretty much wants the perks of the king without the responsibility of ruling. Gideon had lost focus, and it was all about him, his glory, and what he wanted. Second, Gideon sets up the very thing that God had told him to destroy. In Judges 6, 25-32, God tells Gideon to take down an altar to the pagan god Baal and to tear down Asherah poles, which were used by the Israelites to worship false gods. But now we see in chapter 8, verse 27, Gideon is creating an ephod out of gold, which is basically this golden vest used in religious ceremonies. But Gideon sets it up in the middle of his town, and it says, all of Israelite comes and worships it there. And that it was a snare to Gideon and his family. The man who was called by God to lead Israel away from false worship leads their hearts right back to it. And third, I want to point out that Gideon's loss of focus has consequences well beyond himself. Gideon's loss of focus affects him, his family, Israel, and it actually leads to the consequences beyond his life. So going forward, if we kept reading, we'd see that after Gideon's death, Israel like doubles down 
on their idol worship. I mean, they even th- they just dive deeper into the darkness. But then Abimelech, you know, uh, the, the guy innocently named son of the king? Well, he takes his name to heart. He kills every one of Gideon's other sons and then just leads this reign of terror and destruction. And this is our second point. The consequences of taking your focus off of God, it will hurt you. But it's also going to hurt those around you and it can last well beyond the grave. So this next question, this is for the kids and adults as well. So kids, eyes up here, listen up. Who's going to get hurt because you take your focus off of God? Think about the people in your life, your friends, your family. Think about the people God has placed around you. Who's going to get hurt because you take your focus off of God? Are you willing to let that happen? Are you willing to let your lack of focus hurt and harm those around you? I know I'm not. As I've worked through this passage, I have just been brought to my knees to pray, just to beg God, give me the grace. Give me the strength that I can persevere to the end. Help me, Lord, be the man who stays focused on God, who glorifies him with my life. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. Gideon took his focus off of God, and he bought into the things of the world, which was himself his pride, his glory. And so at this point, it's easy to kind of get bummed out. It's kind of depressing. The story ends poorly. And if we keep reading in Judges, it's only going to get worse. But there's a few things, there's a few glimmers of hope I want to point out, even in the midst of this mess. We see God's grace in the fact that the land had peace for 40 years. They didn't deserve that. But God gave it to him anyways. We see God's mercy in the fact that Gideon lived to a good old age. We see God's kindness in the fact that he even freed the Israelites from the Midianite oppression. God knows all things. God knew that Gideon and Israel would turn their backs on him. But yet he still, in his kindness and goodness, freed them. And we see God's involvement in all things and control over all things and that ultimately Israel will stay in existence and from them will come Jesus Christ our Savior, the great deliverer who doesn't just change circumstances but the one we need who changes hearts, who frees us from our most oppressive bondage which is the bondage of our own sin. These glimmers of hope They show us, and I want you to take this away with you, that no matter how bad things look, no matter how messed up things appear, God's light is shining through, and that he is at work working out his good and perfect plan and will. But it is, it is so easy to take our focus off of God. Maybe you're in school and you have to deal with the kid who's being mean to you and you don't know what you're going to do. Teachers can't do anything. Schools usually refuse to do nothing. I mean, what are you going to do? Maybe you're in class and you're failing and you don't know how you're going to pass this class and how you're going to tell your parents. Maybe your life is so busy you don't have time to take your focus off of what's right in front of you. Because if you do, you feel like everything's going to spiral out of control. Maybe, though, your life is going so perfect that you think you just have to make sure nothing changes, that you just stay focused on your dreams and everything will be okay. What if you get the call from your supervisor that they don't know if you have a job next month? 
what if you get the call from the doctor and yeah, it is cancer? These and a million other scenarios can take your focus off of God. And what does it look like when that happens? I think that's a fair question to ask. When we take our focus off of God, it becomes uh, about us. We become self-centered. Life begins to revolve around our dreams, our desires, our wants. When our focus is taken off of God, we can become prideful, arrogant. We're not able to see our own faults that everyone else around us sees, but we're oblivious to them. We start to think that we are God, that we determine right and wrong, that no one has authority over us. It's called autonomy. We think that we are the only ones who have authority over our own lives and who have control. When we lose focus off of God, our judgment what we think is right and wrong. Just things get weird. They get messed up. I wasn't going to share this story, but actually, we have have enough time. I'm going to go into this. Uh, My wife, Sarah, was on the light rail with our oldest, Ava. They went to Wild Kratz Live, which is awesome, by the way. If you don't know what that is, you're missing out. But anyways, they go to that, and on their way home, they're sitting across from this other family, with um, this other child. And so Sarah asked, well, what uh, school does your daughter go to? And they're like, he, you mean he. It's a, it was a boy. Those parents, I don't doubt their love. I don't doubt that they care. I honestly don't question that. They want what's best for their child. But when you take your focus off of God and you start just running roughshod in your own strength, and your own wisdom, and your own power, you do weird things. I mean, just take a step back and think, how is that not going to mess up that kid? How is that not going to make that child's life so much harder than it needs to be? How is it not going to lead that child to a life that is never going to lead to fulfillment, where that child will never know who he is, where that child will never have the contentment and the satisfaction of being able to know, like, yeah, this, this is me. When we take our focus off of God, even our best intentions will hurt those around us and have tragic consequences. So I want us to take a moment. Um, it's only going to be about 30 seconds. And we're, I want you to just prayerfully reflect. Is there any area of my life that I can look at and see like, yeah, I've taken my focus off of God here. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart and bring before you any area where you've lost focus. So let's just prayerfully reflect for a couple seconds. Lord, as we move into the application part of this sermon, don't let us get distracted. Don't let us lose sight of where we have taken our focus off of you, Father. And I ask that the Holy Spirit will hound us to put forth an area, or maybe it's our entire life, just in front of us and before us, that we need to surrender that to you, Lord. But don't let us leave here complacent. Don't let us leave here oblivious of where we've lost focus and where we fall short. And help us to, instead of giving into despair, to just trust those areas to you and replace our focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are three ways, real quick. We can go three ways that, we, that, I, that you could help, uh, three things that you could do that will help you stay focused on God. So you can stay focused on God by learning about who God is, what he's done, and what he's doing. 
And for some of you, that means placing your focus on Christ for the first time. Trusting your life to Jesus for the forgiveness of, his sin, of your sins. Trusting in his life, death, and resurrection. And you know what? The fact that Jesus lived a life you couldn't, died the death you deserved, rose from the grave showing he conquered sin and death, and that through faith in him, you are reconciled to God, brought in God's family and made part of God's kingdom. That's called the gospel. And the gospel means good news. And I tell you, it is such good news for so many reasons. But one of the reasons why the gospel is such good news is that when you place your faith in the gospel, which is placing your faith in Jesus, your heart changes. And that, that change of heart, that's what allows you to desire to focus on God and then focus on him. You can't just try harder with this. You can't just come up with six simple steps to a better life. The only way that you can focus on God and that you will be able to continue to focus on God is through an absolute surrender of your life to Jesus Christ. And for, for others, it's going to be a recommitment, recommitting yourself to knowing who God is, to being in God's word, study it, read it, pray it, sing it. There's a reason all the songs up here are scripturally based. Talk to others about what you know about God, about what he's done in your life, about what he's doing. Talk to others about what Christ will do. I, I, I can't tell you how one of my discipleship groups, us looking about what God will do in the future, just we both at the end, we're just like, wow, God is amazing. Praise the Lord. But you'll find as you do that, your focus will be drawn more and more to God. So the second way that you could focus on God is by reminding yourself every day of all the stuff you learn in step one. I'm a big believer, and Pastor Lynn even said this in his call to worship, you have to preach the gospel to yourself. Every day, remind yourself of the character and goodness of the Lord. Remind yourself, pray. Once again, sing songs that glorify God. Talk to others about God's goodness. But every day, every day, in case you don't get it yet, every day, remind yourself of these truths. And once again, you'll find your heart change. You'll find your mind renewed and more and more will be drawn to Christ. And the third way that you could focus on God is by living for God's glory. And I know those are so stereotypical and just, yeah, the pastor has to say it, but these things are true. We must allow our faith to direct our life. My faith in Jesus determines where my priorities lie. My faith in Christ determine where I spend my time, where I spend my money, where I spend my energy. Our faith must direct our life. And as we do that, as we're saved through faith in Jesus, enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, living for the glory of the Father, you'll find that you can't help but focus on Christ. And all those things, all these things that seem to be so such big distractions. They just fade away and disappear to the background. David Pallison, he was a Christian counselor just involved in that world. He also was a professor at seminary author. He um, was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer in November of 2018. And if you don't know, that's not good. And during that time, he's trying to wrap up a writing project to finish a book. And so as he's dealing with all this stuff, as he's trying to finish up his book, as he faces down death, he wrote, the reality, of the, death, or the reality of death has made the truth of God's word come alive to me. I am now living out the end of 2 Corinthians 4, which says, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction 
is preparing for us an eternal way to glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And then later on in his book that he finished up before he passed away, he wrote, this is what the whole Bible is about. It's about life and death. It's about what's going to happen when you die. It's about right and wrong, true and false, hope and despair, obedience and recklessness, faith and idolatry. This is the drama that we and those we minister to are living in. And the miracle is that we're given a new heart, a heart of flesh and a new spirit so that we can and will live forever. What a privilege it has been for me to serve my faithful Savior these many years. What a privilege it has been to walk with others in need. And what a joy it will be to see him face to face. That's what it looks like to stay focused to the end. And I pray that for myself, I pray for us here at first, and I pray, I desperately pray for all you kids that it will be said of you as well, that they stay focused on God. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just thank you for your grace, for your goodness. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that when we are unfaithful, you are still faithful. We thank you that when you said it was finished on a cross with your hands spread out, you meant it. And now all we have to do, all we have to do is trust our lives to you. Give us the faith to trust our lives to you, Lord. Give us the eyes to see your goodness and what you're doing. In your spirit, Lord, may your spirit guide us each and every day that we can be a people here at first that live every area of our lives for your glory. We ask all these things in your mighty and awesome name.